Welcome to The Hustle with your host, myself, Ben Anderson. We're here today with Paul and Lily Dactarian, founders of luxury real estate giant, the Dactarian Group. So sit back, listen, and learn as we chat with Paul and Lily on their journey to success. Nothing will work unless you do. Let's go crush it. This group thrives in a luxury market specializing in six-star service with their clients. With their focus on exclusive enclaves of coastal Orange County, they deploy their effective sales and marketing plan to perfection. They deal with pro athletes, entrepreneurs, and CEOs. Paul's been a consistent top-selling agent and started off in the mortgage business, so he gets my pain. Lily and her family started out in the real estate business over 15 years ago. They created a team of husband and wife like nobody else I've met before. The Daftarian Group is one of the largest, fastest growing groups in the country, ranked by Wall Street Journal as a 48th real estate trend, real estate group of 2018. They're on the board of Chalk, and their philanthropy is genuine. Let's welcome the Daftarian Group. Hi, guys. Hi. Ben, thanks for having us. You're welcome, guys. I'm excited. The first team on this podcast that's your real estate team and a family. I'm honored to have you guys here because your success speaks for itself. So before we get started and talk about your journey and the hustle, I want to know how a husband-wife team makes in this modern-day real estate world together. Lily, I'll let you start. <laughs> I got my own opinions. Well, there. Paul and I never <laughs> imagined we'd be working together. So um, it was something new for us, and there is a lot of challenges along the way. I think what happened is our vision was in line, and we were very in tune with our execution of what we wanted to do in the real estate industry right. and what we wanted to bring uh, was refreshing. And I feel like we kind of disrupted the whole industry in Orange County a little bit. Yes. And we make people work a little bit harder for those real estate transactions now. That's right. That's right. And so I think what happened is we kind of just went with it and um, created our brand. And now we work together. It's uh, It uh, has its ups and downs. But for the most part, I think having all the successes uh, show for itself is what we always wanted um, with the, with our goals. Yeah, I, I think that uh, we, we I, Lily said it best, we had a vision, it was in line with each other's goal, and we wanted to go into a space where we thought we could add some value and there was opportunity, and we were both honest with each other that there was no days off, there's going to be, you know, it's tough to work with anyone that you go home to, whether it's your children, a spouse, a parent, because you have to be brutally honest at work, and sometimes that does carry over. We weren't naive to think that if we're arguing over a marketing uh, decision or the way to, I mean, it could be as simple as a closing gift for a client. I mean, there's like bickering turns into arguing, arguing turns into resentment. So we were always honest with each other that we're trying to leave that stuff at the office, but yet we were working at home seven days a week. So that that's the down. The up is that we get to see each other all the time. You know, I don't have to, she doesn't have to travel out of the state for work. We're with our kids every night and um, it's, it's a family unit and we've kind of built a culture in our business where it is kind of an extension of our family, everyone that works with us. So people work every single day without feeling like they work every single day. So talk to us about, because this on this podcast could be thousands or millions of listeners and they're maybe entering into a conversation about let's start something together. Uh, I think it's everyone's dream to own their own company, but everyone's fear is to lose their company. And if you're running a company with a spouse, there's a lot to lose. So what's that conversation like when you sit down and you say, let's do something, let's build something together? What's that like? You know, I, uh, you know I'll tell you, I'll comment on that. I think that you have to know who you are yourself. You have to be honest, and then you have to know your spouse. You know, like, for example, I'm kind of crazy, right? <laughs> Lily knows I'm the eccentric one. Uh, I'm like kind of the artist. She's the executor of, of, you know, the ops, and she's like the one that gets everything done. I'm the creative person in some, and we switch roles, but I'm just mm -hmm. talking like our, our main roles, right? Mm -hmm. And she's also an extremely loyal person, and I don't think a lot of wives could work with me and deal with my craziness and my this perfectionist attitude and like nothing's ever good enough without like actually hating me. I mean, <laughs> I'm just being honest, yeah. right? It's, it's, I'm a handful. And uh, Lily has that really patient personality. She knows that like I'm the guy that leads the sales team. She lets me be, play my role. And she knows that ultimately she has a lot of say in a lot of areas that, that you know, trump what I have to say, but mm -hmm. she doesn't go out there and try to like flex and, and try to have that power trip. 
in front of the whole team. So that's that was the one thing, is that our personalities will work together. Mm-hmm. I also knew that if we ever have any bumps along the road, we're going to stay together marriage-wise and business-wise because I just knew her character. And that's really what matters. I think people are very short-sighted. And I've seen a lot of businesses start out together, blow up, do well, and people get divorced because they have a sense of entitlement and they feel like they didn't get enough recognition. And when all the stress of building it goes away, then people start analyzing situations and start, you know, placing blame like oh you weren't you didn't do this or you didn't do that and she's not like that at all yeah i think that there's a lot of emotion that people have to remove from Mm. you know a partnership and business i feel like when the emotions get in the way uh you lose sight of what the what's important and um, i feel like you just have to have a game face and you have to know when to bring the game face and when to make business business and there has to be a line like i feel like with paul and i we're very much like you know, when we're in the office working, we're business. And we do have fun, of course, but at the same time, you know, we don't want to waste time and we don't want to bring in any baggage or unnecessary emotions into our business. We want to make sure that we're thinking with our brain and we're executing things the right way. So I think that's something people have to understand is you have to establish a role that is business only and when to check in and check out of the whole family dynamic. That's great. And I guess the, the what, what I'm hearing is if you can't trust your spouse, who can you trust? Yeah. Right. And if there's someone you can trust at home, then you should be able to make it work in yes. the office space as well. And if it does, it's beautiful music. And, you know, you guys have been doing some great things in the last five years. And this t- this, this market in Orange County is, um, and I, I do loans all over the country in 48 states. And I would say that the coastal Orange County market is the toughest market to break into just because people aren't generally that accepting of new agents. And so tell us in in one of the tougher markets in the whole country, how you've taken up so much momentum momentum and how you've made people realize that we're here to stay and we're a force to be reckoned with. Yeah, you know, for me, it was kind of like the in and out analogy. You know, if there's in and out on a corner, they're not going to put a you know, habit or, you know, another burger place, right? You have to do something different. So mm-hmm. you know, Orange County already had its set agents. It's a good old boys club, especially by the water. And we had to do something different. So when the market crashed, um, you know, what we thought was let's improvise uh, and come up with a you know, a business philosophy that really is about servicing the client. The good news is when, you know, the kind of mortgage meltdown happened, a lot of the agents got pushed out of the business. They didn't have the money to market. They just didn't have the stamina to to kind of weather the storm. And you had a lot of like tenured, experienced agents that kind of got all the business and they were the only ones around to capture the business in 2000, you know, 9, 10, 11, and 12. So we saw that as an opportunity Mm -hmm. because there was a little bit of a sense of entitlement Mm -hmm. because they were the king of the hill. So if you sold in a certain area, that agent's like, look, I'm the agent or my partner and I are the agent. We expect the business. We own this area. Right. So what we thought is, wait a minute. Okay, where is the service level? I mean, real estate is a service business, Mm -hmm. just like loans, right? You're selling air. You're selling advice. Yes. You know, there's an instrument in a loan business, but in real estate, there's a property. It's real property, but it's still an experience. And we thought, hey, you know what? Everyone thinks, you know. Macy's or Nordstrom, or Nordstrom Experience. What about the Neiman Marcus Experience? What about White Glove? What about right. Six Star? So that was our first idea to kind of mm-hmm. differentiate ourselves. And that, that you know, kind of it dovetailed because we were flipping homes before. So we had contractors, interior designers, stagers, everybody. And, you know, financial planners, mortgage people, trust attorneys, estate planners. We, we brought all that in in the beginning mm-hmm. and our hyper busy clients that were kind of getting through the financial crisis that were successful needed kind of a suite of services. So that was how we started. That was the, the yeah. core philosophy yeah. was a six star differentiator. Different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think if you're going to do anything and get into a space that you don't have an existing you know business platform in, you've got to do something differently because if you don't, why would they use you over the, the existing top person? Mm-hmm. I think that is the hustle and that's the whole basis of the show is showing people around the world whether you're living in a different state or a different area or a different industry, you have to hustle your way. And I want to talk about your guys' hustle because people might see the nice cars that you drive, the pocket squares, Mm -hmm. uh, the beautiful family, the kids, the pictures, the Instagram posts, but they don't understand what went into that behind the scenes. Like you said before, you don't get weekends. You don't get holidays. It's it's 24-7, especially in the very beginning. So what are those days like? If someone's thinking they can break into real estate, you know, what are the Mm -hmm. things you had to do not to get into real estate, but to take a piece of one of the highest end markets in the whole entire country? What did you have to go through? 
Well, we, you know, had to make a lot of sacrifices. We worked 12, 15 hour days for maybe one to two years straight. And what we kept doing is researching what we wanted to do, what people are currently doing, and what we can do to one up everybody. And we introduced a lot of lifestyle events. We introduced a lot of different marketing uh, tactics. And we also brought in, you know, because of our background with remodeling and flipping homes, we brought in a lot of that advice that we would give our clients to maybe fix up their homes in a certain way to sell it. It would be more appealing to a buyer. But a lot of people think it was really easy for some reason. I don't sure. know if we make it look really easy, sure. but you, it, you, you know, you, you we, <laughs> there was a lot of sacrificing, a lot of night work and we would only sleep, you know, four or five hours a night, maybe if that, but I mean, a lot of research, you just have to do so much, re- so much research and see what can you do that's different from what everyone else is doing? And it's not easy to do that. And it's not easy to take that risk and take that chance. But we wanted to do it. We did it knowing it could fail. But at the end of the day, you don't know unless you try. And mm-hmm. what we did was we tried. Some things didn't work, but you don't want to give up. We literally had this goal in mind to do something different in this real estate industry. And I feel like trial and error, we made it happen. It wasn't easy and it's not easy. But you know, if you have that goal in mind and you're willing to take the chance and the risk, it's worth it. And Paul, what's it like for you having a partner like that that's gonna go to bat? And what are the things you had to go through? I mean, are there things that maybe you had to deal with as like the head of the household or the leader of the company or the salesperson, I should say? Yeah. You're like, I've, I've got to do this for, because you have kids, yeah. not as if you were taking on this job when your kids were in college and you could afford to take a flyer. Yeah. I mean, this is like all or nothing right. stuff yeah. we're talking about here. You know, what's interesting is when we started this business, you know, our oldest daughter, uh, Natasha, is five years old. She just turned five. And this business is about five years old. So yeah. we had like two babies at the same time. Right. One was the business, one was Natasha. That's yeah. crazy. And, and, and I'll never forget, it's so funny, I don't even talk to Lily about this, but like one of the most insane moments for me was when Lily delivered Natasha and she had a C-section, so it wasn't like, you know. That's you know, surgery. Yeah, that's surgery, right? Literally, the, like hours later, she had a laptop on her stomach, like that's punching something gangster. out. gangster. Yeah, and it was midnight. We had to get something out for like a closing the next day. I mean... So, you know, for me, it's like I'm running the race and I'm redlining, but she's like the nitrous. Right. Right. So so there's a lot of times where I'm like at home and I got that scotch in my hand and it's midnight and I'm like, man, I'm so tired. My eyes are burning. I can't continue to type this like listing proposal or like these responses. And she would like literally come downstairs and be like, give me the laptop. I love that. You know, so I think those are the those are those are the stories that like you don't get to tell yeah. because people just say, "Oh, here's your perfect flyer and here's the just sold. The house must have sold itself." I mean, the interesting thing is now people are in trend to go and like remodel their house a little bit before they sell it. 5 years ago, we had really tough conversations. I noticed with salespeople, they avoid tough conversations, yes. right? Like a loan gets declined and they're like, "Uh, I'll tell them after lunch. Let me yes. just eat," right? <laughs> That's like that, you know, avoiding it, right? When when you get maturity and experience you realize the sooner you deal with problems the better the outcome mm-hmm. is going to be right mm-hmm. so for us we had tough conversations with clients saying listen um if you look at our core uh kind of conversion it's been taking over bad listings and what i mean by bad just unsuccessful so we come in there and just like when we were flipping homes when you flip a home you don't think i hope to sell it you're like i have to sell it it just depends at what price so we brought that mindset and energy into every listing of like it has to sell. We chose to work with sellers that were serious, not like I'm going to test the market. Right. And then we said, look, you have to make these changes or else your house won't sell for the number you want. You'll Without to... insulting them. Without insulting them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Which is really tough. Pro- is that why the yin and the yang works a yeah. lot with you yes. guys? Because we have the yin and the yang yes. and someone saying, here's bad news, but here's why yeah. it's not so bad. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, no, here's the solution. Yeah. Here's Got the it. Solution. So never give someone bad news unless you have a solution. Got it. Right? Great advice right so there. So it isn't like, yeah. oh, your house is terrible. We have to burn it down to the ground. Right? Right. It's never that. I mean, yeah. luckily, that's the space we, you know, work in. Now, if you really think about it, we thought of something, you know, again, going back to flipping homes, the most expensive part of a house is the dirt, not the house typically. So we had to kind of promote the lifestyle of these houses to say, hey, you get into this entry level home in Newport Coast that's gated that you get to, if you want, have your children go to this great, you know, nine out of 10 star 
elementary school, right? Mm -hmm. If you live in like, you know, Turtle Ridge or, you know, the Port Streets, you get all this school benefit, right? Mm -hmm. You get this lifestyle benefit. You're walking distance in some areas from like Fashion Island or the beach. So, you know, take the energy and focus off maybe the house having like old doors and windows, things that maybe low ceiling heights and like maybe do a fresher on paint and staging and all that and lighting and just create the energy. We feel like houses need to have an emotional Mm -hmm. reaction on you because you're not buying, you know, look, uh, the house we live in, for example, in Turtle Ridge, right? If you picked it up and put it in somewhere else, it's a seven hundred thousand dollar house. It's nothing extraordinary, right? It's two by four construction. We've remodeled it and it's great now. When we bought it, it was kind of you know not great, but the point is that it's the lifestyle you're getting into. And we kind of saw that and we pushed that versus oh, this is a four bedroom house and it's twenty eight hundred mm-hmm. square feet. It's mm-hmm. the same thing in mortgages, right? Everyone thinks you're a commodity, right? In your business, like what's your rate? What's your fee? It's like, wait a minute, how about I can get this deal closed on time and you actually get this house right. versus getting a notice to perform and losing your deposit, right? Right. So it's, it's not redirection, but it's just focusing on some other important areas, not just the, the easy out, which is what's your rate and fee. Yeah. What's your great vision? And I see that you've, you've basically applied yourself and taken things you've learned. Mortgage taught you a certain thing. You got into the basically people business of understanding how to remodel, mm-hmm. turn that into how to get the best for your value for your home. Yeah. And now you guys are running a whole entire you know, globally ranked company, which is amazing. We're even sitting here talking about how you can stop your day and spend time with me talking about your business is amazing. So let's talk about the day in the life of, because people don't understand that there isn't like a like a alarm clock in a school. It's like if a client in 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 out of state wants mm-hmm. to buy a property and they're in New York, you're taking the call at three o'clock in the morning. You know, mm-hmm. what is a general day in the life of from the time you get up in the morning? the time you go to bed with balancing two kids, Mm -hmm. going on vacation without a nanny like you told me, you went to Hawaii Mm -hmm. and you're courageous enough not to have a nanny go with you to Hawaii, which is which is is impressive. It's impressive. So how do you how do you do mom, do the kids, manage real estate, manage a husband? Mm -hmm. Uh, what's a day in the life? Because if someone wants to be a luxury agent, you know, you can go work in 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 this business and close a deal a month or two and, and be okay. But I have a feeling you guys want it all. So what's that like? Yeah, you know, it's it's definitely not easy. I get asked that all the time. And one of my main responses is I can't really stop to think about what I'm doing. I just have to do. Mm. So I don't sit down. Paul always makes fun of me. He's like, wow, when I come home, you're never even sitting down. You eat sometimes standing up, which isn't, you know, there's some things I want to change. But at the end of the day, like he said, I like to execute things. So it's getting up in the morning. Let's get ready. We're on a routine. Eat breakfast get the girls ready for school, go drop them off, go to the office, do whatever we have to do. His phone starts ringing at like seven in the morning. And like you said, he does not let it go to voicemail. It's very rare. He does like to answer the phone all I mean, the time. I take time. the phone in the shower, by the Good. way, for the record. <laughs> That's a six star right there. Yeah. The shower yeah. is the six star <laughs> service. <laughs> yeah. So if you want to buy a house, this guy's going to answer your phone in the shower. I yeah. love that. That's yeah. amazing. And you know, we, we work all day. I will go back to pick up the kids in the later in the evening, go home, try to put a nice meal together, <laughs> whatever I can, and you know, try to go back and work a little bit more, get them ready for bed, work a little bit more. You know, just it's hard to leave the work at the office, so the work does carry into our home quite often every day, I would say. Um, but I do I am very hands-on mom. So that is something I take extremely seriously. My role as a mother is very important to me. Yeah, but when you say it's by far your number one priority. Oh, I mean, I'm raising yeah. two humans. Yeah, yeah. I do yeah. take that yeah. very I mean, seriously. You know, we've uh, we both, Lily and I, grew up with having you know great parents that sacrificed a lot for us, mm-hmm. but they weren't like all four parents weren't present. You know, like right. I played, you know, whether I played a varsity sport or did something at school, my parents never came to a single game. They were always working, right? So we discussed, Lily and I, when we had children, that we wanted to be present, even as crazy busy as I am. Mm-hmm. Even my daughter's like 10 minute, like kind of quasi ballet recital. recital thing, I'll right. run over there. And, right. you know, but we've created a system that works because our my daughter's school is like, you know, nine minutes from my office or nine, 10 minutes from any listing we have. So it's not like, you know, that's why we choose not to like do business in LA independently, even though we have some, we've done a lot of business in LA, but we'll co-list, right? I mean, you, know, the, you can kind of create the situation you want. Lily and I allow a little bit of chaos to come into it because mm-hmm. that's just our business. Mm-hmm. But, you know, she does balance the mom work thing really well. Uh, you know, I obviously, there's not really a balance. I'm not really a balanced person, by the way. I have to be honest with you. <laughs> I don't believe in the world. I love the honesty. I yeah. I, I don't think there's balance, right? Because our business is so reactive. Imagine you're trying to like get a hundred jobs and you put a hundred resumes out and like five of them call you back. You're not going to be like, well, I'm not available for an interview tomorrow. 
right? Not really. Not if that's what you do. That's what I do every day is go on job interviews, if you really think about it. I mean, you do too on the phone, right? right. People are interviewing you. Should I use my private banker? Should I use my guy, you know, bank of whatever? And you've got to basically pitch yourself every day. And that, mm-hmm. that could be a 7 a.m. call. It could be 10 p.m. You know, when that person calls you, the difference with us is we go back to like the differentiator. We noticed we couldn't get a hold of, of a lot of realtors. When I was in the mortgage business, you could never get a hold of a realtor. And this is obviously pre-text message, but even in text messages, the loan officer is the king of like icing you when there's bad news, but a realtor is just hard to get a hold of sometimes. Yes. You know, because they're in meetings or with clients or they just kind of don't want to answer their phone. So for me, it's hard to kind of create a balance when you're when you are on call almost every day. Now, my kind of time with my family, I would say, is the morning because you know from like seven to nine when the kids are up, that's where I get to spend quality time with them. Like this morning, I made mm-hmm. them breakfast. Lily was getting ready. We came down, had breakfast together. The kids are, you know, I dressed them, which I hope they were matching, but uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the same socks on. <laughs> but you know, I mean, you know, that that's kind of kind of my quality time with them. And then we do spend. Like these holidays, Thanksgiving to Christmas to New Year's, we host it at our house, mm-hmm. and we had nice. the family come over, and the kids were there, and our friend, our you know, our kids' friends were there. So we do get to like have that quote unquote balance, I guess. But mm-hmm. it's an extreme situation because they know Daddy gets up and goes to work every single day, you know, including Saturdays and Sundays. So they don't they don't know any different. It's not like you know they live a life where I used to be home on the weekends, and then now I'm not. So they're yeah. they're, they're conditioned to it. But we the the good and bad thing is we get to control our schedule, so we choose to work a lot, especially me mm-hmm. be out of the house but for moments of like importance which there's a lot of them I can easily be there it's not like I'm sitting in Milwaukee at some consulting business where I physically can't be here yeah, and some realtors choose that pathway life because they think I can set my own schedule but mm-hmm. it's a blessing and it's a curse because Absolutely. no one's holding you accountable no one's you really have to be that type a a a neurotic eccentric extremely out there personality to want that lifestyle so talk about your level of service for your clients, the level you go, because it is your model that it's six star service. And I want to really highlight that because I deal with lots of realtors and 0.1 tenth of 1% probably have the service level you guys have from what I've seen. Well, we appreciate you saying that. That's Mm -hmm. a big compliment coming from you considering how many loans you've done, how much interaction. So I'll answer that question first. So I did a thousand purchase loans under my, you know, under my license when I was a mortgage originator, because even when I owned my mortgage company, like you, I was always an active producer. I never just sat in an office and was an operator. So you know, think about that. There's two realtors usually on every side. So that's like, let's call it, you know, 17, 1800 experiences I had with different realtors. Yes. And I got to use that as a model of what I liked and didn't like. Uh, I think the number one thing I didn't like is that realtors did look at clients as commission checks. Mm-hmm. So that was the number one thing. We, Lily and I, this is something we didn't even have to discuss. We both thought mm-hmm. this, that if you treat your client like they're your only client and they're gold, then the money will always follow. That's a, let's stop and pause on that for a second. So if you treat your client like they're your only client, because when you have your first client and your only client, I mean, you're basically babysitting them to death. And I know when I had my first mortgage client, I was like calling them 10 times a day. Are you still wanting to buy, do this loan? And I didn't need to do that. But I, I, that commission, the first one was so important. So, yeah. you know, it for me, I can't say that I'd do that as well as maybe I could. So that's a takeaway for me is treating every client like your only client. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you bring yeah. on staff and support staff like, you know, holiday gifts and like just daily updates and just touch bases. Right. So when your book of business gets bigger and bigger and bigger, that was another nice thing about doing luxury real estate. We don't have to do 20 transactions a month. So even if we do, you know, two to five, right. you know, there's only that many sets of clients that we have to maintain. A lot of our clients are repeat. The areas that we service, a lot of clients are doing like sometimes, you know, within the last five years, three, four transactions with us. So it's not like we have to you know, kind of handhold and manage thousands of clients. Mm-hmm. And honestly, that's why I didn't want to kind of reinvest back in the mortgage business because one, I didn't want to have 300 salespeople. Yes. I didn't want to sit behind a desk and I wanted to deal with a fewer number of select clients. So it all started with like what we want. I always say in our business, let's focus on what we want. We want to sit down, visualize what we want. You can call it the secret or manifestation or whatever, meditation. But we sit down, Lily and I, whether we did it independently or together, we literally sat down and visualized the success. 
Number two, we put a plan together. I'm a big like numbers guy coming from the mortgage business, Todd Duncan training. And, you know, now we trained with uh, Tom Ferry for quite a long time, almost five years. And, you know, you do a business plan and that business plan literally tells you now how many text messages you need to send a day. So we have some kind of regimented uh, kind of daily objective and, and tasks and targets. So that helps us out. But, you know, I think for us, part of the improvement, like you said, the takeaway is always how can we continue to do better? You know, people always say always be closing. You know, I always say always be changing. And by changing, we mean improving because what we did yesterday Mm -hmm. isn't going to work tomorrow. That's interesting. So how has, because you've been 1999 to 2000 and almost 19 now, so it's 20 year run in the real estate industry. So everything's changing around us. And I I almost say it's already changed, you know? Mm -hmm. So how are you guys advancing using things like social media that most people are afraid to use, how have you adopted that as a core principle of your business and how is that changing things for you guys? You know, the, the reach we have through social media and exposure, it's like everyone, and that's it's, I'm glad that's a, that's a good tie-in because a lot of our clients feel like they're part of our weekly, daily lives without actually talking to us. So mm-hmm. that's why we make sure to post things about our family, our children, our, our successes, our failures, our you know, listings, our closings. So people feel like, and that's, that's the fantastic thing about social media, but it's also the worst thing about and it. And the right? failures mm-hmm. too. Let's talk about the, not, we want to bring up like, the worst deal you ever did, but mm-hmm. just sharing transparently your life with your clients and how people's biggest fear is just sharing the whole piece of their life and sharing the ins and outs. But you're truly always blending everything together. So you guys epitomize mm-hmm. the modern day family, working, living, breathing, eating, kids mismatching socks, still going to school, yeah. traveling, no nanny, and you're just showing all that. I think that's mm-hmm. a big also differentiator, don't you agree? It is, and I think that has nothing to do with the business we're in. That has to do with Lily and I. I mean, Lily, for example, just threw one of our best friends a uh, baby shower, and she, I think, decided to do I mean, she had some help, but she took it upon herself to almost do the entire thing on her own. I mean, literally, like, mm-hmm. make the appetizers, do the flower arrangement, like, mm-hmm. you know, literally. And she was up to, like, 2, 3 in the morning multiple nights in a row. That's just, like, her personality. And then, you know, business for me and other things, I'm the same way. You just don't stop till you get it right. And, again, it goes back to our own set level of standards. Like, yeah. if you come to our house which hopefully we'll invite you one time if, love you, if you see how we just entertain. And I don't know if that's like the Persian DNA in us, but like, you know, it. if you have like a two people come over, you feed them for 20. I love right? it. Yeah. So that's that it. kind of, yeah. that, that kind of overflows into our business. So you absolutely. Know. I always say our clients become our family and it's something that is very true. We become very close with our family clients we actually end up having a lot in common with our clients whether it's family dynamics or anything life related hobbies yeah I yeah mean, like i'm a car nut i have made so many friends through the car industry you know we, we love just being in the area that we live in and like you know shopping dining all that fun stuff and then the kids the school yeah. kind of enter, you know the, the play dates and like a lot of our friends have just happened to, you know you kind of Put, you get what you put out there, right? And like we've met mm-hmm. so many great clients that have kids our own age and they become friends. Like last night, mm-hmm. Lily went to a birthday party, a uh, very small, intimate one, just with another wife and her, their daughter, who's like our daughter's kind of best friend now. And it's so great because we met him through business, right? So mm-hmm. it's been, we look at it as like all upside. You know, it's, yeah. it's yeah. the people I think so when we are get... pretty interesting and dynamic and they're, we just attract great people. Yeah, That's I think great. when we get a listing or even on a sales side, it doesn't end. I feel like when we get the listing, we're very involved throughout the whole thing. Any changes we can make to the house, um, checking in with them, doing whatever we can. We really want to show our clients how in, how interest, how vested we are in yeah. not only selling their home, but being the best for them, helping them out with anything they need. Then when we also sell them a home, I think we come in and they usually ask us for advice after they've so they bought a home. What do you think? Do you think I should remodel the kitchen like this? We'll go in afterwards and, yeah, you know, multiple. Give, we might be there 10. We might be yeah. there more after the sale than before. Absolutely. Right? And bring our interior designers, yeah. kind of give them our advice. You know, I think um, another thing, too, is, uh, you know, a lot of the newer agents that we talked to or even our own newer agents are like, well, how do I become the best? And I say, you know, I hate to say it. It's going to take some experience. You have to develop something called taste, right? People in our price bracket typically have good taste or they hire people with good taste, right? Could be everything from their wardrobe to their furniture, to their house remodel, to the car they drive, whatever, right? Um, so I think that 
that for some people that happens instantly and they get it and they've always been a big fan of that or they have to learn it over time like they understand that if someone's sitting in a five million dollar home in Corona del Mar it's not just about putting a Fleetwood you know pocket door it's like what furniture do they want what what style goes with that Cape Cod look so I think that all just kind of develops good taste now Lily and I have had so much experience with houses with furniture with all this stuff we've developed what we think is in line, like good taste with our client. So a lot of times when we make recommendations, like I'll show you a text right before I walked in here, this client's like asking me to pick the countertops that are gonna go in their house for their remodel because they're not even in the area. So I mean, imagine that responsibility. Right. If I tell them Calicutta Gold versus Taj Mahal and the house doesn't sell, guess what? They're gonna come back to me and say, you chose the wrong countertop. Right. So there's a lot of that, even though we don't feel that pressure, it's pressure on every single level. Because we're saying these are the things you need to do to achieve this result. You need to take our advice if you want this outcome. And they do, and we have to be on 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. I think you just make people feel good. And, and by making them feel good, they trust you. And you're not willing to live with your own decisions because you trust your own ability to make those calls because you are meticulous and you work your butt off every single day. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, first of all, you guys' success is only going to go up because how you're engineering your company and the vision and the thought process and the making it better and better and better. It's only been five years, but I feel like you guys have been 20 years in the real estate sales business. Yeah. So for newer agents or experienced agents, the market is going through a lot right now and people have lost their lust and their zest for getting up every single day. You clearly have not. What advice do you give a, a, a new agent and what advice do you give an existing agent in how to be successful today? A couple of tips. Um, you know, I think the best two tips I can give you is, listen, we've been spoiled, right? The MLS sold your house for you for the last four or five years. Right. So don't get it twisted. You're on vacation. Yes. Right now is to put on your big girl, big boy pants and start working. Yes. So just because you pressed enter on the MLS doesn't mean you deserve a commission check. Bully, preach, please. Yeah. So that's number one. Number two, you have to know your customer. Now, if you're a listing agent, you have to know buyers better than you know yourself. And that's how you can make sure the house looks the way they want it to look, price the way they want it to be. Because no matter what, where you sell a house, there's a housing shortage in America. I don't care how much inventory there is. The, re the only reason things slow down is if there's a lot of inventory, then you gotta be you know, more aggressively priced. You have to be more remodeled. You have to be something different. Real estate is supply and demand, right? It's competition. It's getting picked for a beauty pageant every mm, single day on it. the MLS, right? So you have to be, I don't wanna use the word psychotic, but you have to be very intense with knowing the customer base. And I feel mm -hmm. like listing agents or even buyer's agents, they don't even know the different market. Like in our marketplaces, if you give me a street address, I probably know the outside of the house. And as I mean, think about the level of preparation mm -hmm. that has gone into your day. And I think mm -hmm. the, the big difference that I'm hearing from talking to agents and agents is you are prepared for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I have, I don't want to discount what you're saying, but look, when I, when, you know, how long have you been in the mortgage business? 15 years. 15 years. So was the internet the same 15 years ago? Heck no. How did people go to broker caravans? Do you remember? 15 they used years to, ago. They so used what, to drive around uh, a and, street, right? Yeah, so you used to get emailed a list. Yes. There's no app. There's no CRMLS app. There's no data available at your fingertips. Like now I could literally go to a listing in like, you know, wherever, uh, you know, Connecticut, and I could probably within hours understand and be an expert in the market. So the ama amazing tools of technology mm -hmm. have, look, I'm not gonna lie, there's some listings I go to that are like out of my comfort zone where I have to use GPS how to get there. Like Lily and I, we mm -hmm. listed a, um, we listed a house in Santa Ana mm -hmm. in Floral Park, okay? It was the most expensive home ever in Floral Park. We listed it for 2.4 million, right by Main Place Mall. Yes. You know, it wasn't a great neighborhood to go through to get to it, but once you got to it, I'd never been to the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And we sold it, we shattered the highest sale record ever because we studied, there was information, we talked to the homeowners, we went to other broker caravans. So I don't think it's that hard. In my opinion, to be a top producing mortgage professional, to be a CPA, to be a financial planner, there's so much more preparation. Real estate, there's less moving parts, there's less sales, there's less data to memorize, and there's only so many neighborhoods, and most of them are tracked homes. Mm -hmm. So like in Newport Coast, I know in like my one of our main gates, there's 12 different models. Go pull up inside track, study the floor plans. Like prepare, like we tell our newer agents, mm -hmm. already manifest that you're gonna get that listing call and then be the expert and say, okay, I know you have the Cassis C plan B, right? And that information's all available. I feel like realtors are like listening to podcasts or even mortgage professionals like, what should I do? Start studying every yeah. morning. I get on financial news and I study the MLS for 30 minutes every yeah. day no matter what. I always what. tell our agents, study like you're studying for an exam. 
Yeah. And, and if you don't, why are you there? doing what you're doing? And I think exactly. t- tell, uh, we talked a little bit before about the example of the guy that you crossed paths with at the car uh, location. And so I think that's a great example of uh, how you know if you should be in the business or not. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, as far as what the, you got the car service and the guy wanted to get in the business. He wanted oh, to work oh, yeah, yesterday. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I went to go pick up my car from the the, um, the dealership yesterday from being serviced. And he goes, oh, you know, I saw these amazing listing brochures. And our listing brochures are huge. They're like 24 by 24 inches. And uh, the guy was like, you know, I always kind of like daydreamed about getting into real estate. I said, me too. Fantastic. I didn't for 18 years for a very specific reason. I didn't want to not have weekends and nights. Right. So I said, you know, this is a business that's 24 seven, seven days a week. So I told him very simply, I said, if you're willing to work when other people are resting, relaxing and vacationing, then you should get in the business. But if you don't, and you want to see your family and you want to see your kids every night, you want to stop taking calls at 6 p.m. Because it's interesting because he has a cell phone for you know, customers to uh, make sure like the service connection is great. It's a high-end dealership, right? Um, but it shuts off at 6. I said, I should be able to call you at midnight if I want. Right. Mm-hmm. Right? And I can't. So that's the trade-off. And he, the light bulb went off of his head and he goes, okay, I like my job. <laughs> so that's if you are in the business, decide if you want to evolve and adapt. Mm-hmm. You have to take on that mentality of I'm no longer going to make this a part-time job. It's an all-the-time job now. I'm going to yeah. commit to being yeah. an expert, being a better student. It's like school shouldn't stop when you graduate high school. Mm-hmm. When you're in high school, you're on a seven-period schedule. You're time blocking. Yeah. You're learning math and English and foreign languages. And then you get out of out of high school, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay, I can stay in the same position that I'm at for the rest of my life. And that's just mm-hmm. not true. Yeah, you know, another thing too that's interesting. Yeah. I do want to mention. So you know, um, I just a couple of key things I want to mention. We we aren't reactive in the sense that clients control our schedule. We're also very strict with our schedule. Mm-hmm. So someone's urgency isn't our emergency. Got what it. I mean by that is, you know, we don't let the tail wag the dog because we mm-hmm. have to execute mm-hmm. on a high level. So there is a lot of, you know, conformity to a, to a schedule, to time blocking, you know, and all, you know, we don't let like clients, like, look, if you have a listing appointment, you might push back your prospecting or hour of power, or whatever you want to call it, but you still got to get it done. Yes. Right. It's like, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's like, I, I have a buddy of mine, uh, shout out to Nick Long from Next 90. Nick but, Long, uh, Next 90, what up? <laughs> but, uh, you know, he always says like, you can't read about doing push ups or sit ups. You actually have to do them. So in our business, people get a lot of business, like in your business. They start taking apps and they work on the business and they stop, you know, prospecting. Yes. Right. And that's how you have these like peaks and valleys. Yes. Mm-hmm. So for our team, we've been really diligent after doing sales for, you know, I got in the mortgage business actually, hey, to admit it, 1995. So nice. it's been 20, 24 years 20, now. Yeah, 24 years consistently of sales. And the peaks and valleys simply happen because you stop prospecting. You fill your plate with business and you like will it, you manifest it, you hustle, you know, you hustle hard like your, your motto and then you get the business but you take your eye off your origination ball mm-hmm. and that's where I think that the peaks and valleys happen and that's where you need to have time blocking. You need to be disciplined. Again, things like someone calling you to app them for a mortgage, that's like what you're fishing for all day long but that doesn't happen 10 times a day. Well, I mean, maybe if you work at like lending tree or something, That's right. you know, right? But my point is, in our business, it does it, right? Yeah. You go on. I think there's like two important things: is a goal and consistency. Yeah, consistency. I think and goal. those are very important because people get into real estate. They're so motivated, so excited. After three months of not making any money, they get burned out. But they lose the consistency. They lose their their eye on their target, which is their goal, and they they're like, okay, I need to go on to another thing. So that's we see that happen quite often. Yeah. People need to understand that this is like a workout. You have to be committed to doing every single day, working every single day, consistency, goal driven. And yes, you do have to have that personality where you are independently employed. So you have to understand you set your own hours. It can get become very easy to be like, oh, I'll just do that later because you don't That's have right. a boss on top of you no. reminding you, do this, do that. So mm-hmm. you have to be extremely hard on yourself and self-disciplined and remind yourself, if I don't do this, no one's going to be there to tell me what to do. That's right. No one's going to put that money in my bank account. It's all on me. But the beauty of it is you have the ability to make the six, seven figure income. So it's all up to you what you want in your life. Do you want to work the nine to five and be extremely comfortable like, you know, for example, the service manager, or do you want to just I mean, his blood, defense, sweat, and, and, and tears and, his defense, and have the potential? He's eight to six, 30, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or blood, sweat, and tears, but have the credit, potential yeah. for 
multi-million dollar income producing, right. you know. You want the potential. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's no easy way out, right? I mean, yeah. this isn't, the, there's nothing worthwhile that comes easy in my opinion, right? So if you want to be the biggest mortgage, mortgage originator in the world, if you want to own the biggest appraisal company, if you want to have the biggest escrow chain, I mean, these are all service businesses. And you know we've seen a lot of uh, ups and downs, but no matter what, people have always managed to survive. And they've held themselves to a higher standard. They knew who they were, and they knew how to exceed clients' expectations. You know, we always say six-star service, but really, what we're really saying is just figure out how to exceed your client's expectation. Because no matter what, like we just closed a deal where we had a record sale for a client, and it was one of our other agents who was running lead on it, and uh, the client didn't seem to give us like the oh my God, best experience of my life reaction. So we like, you know, besides going to, planning to take him out to dinner, we called a meeting and we're going to address it right now. Like what happened? You know, like we, we the result yes. spoke for itself. And he's like, oh, and we know, we know what it was, but the point is we're not going to let that just fester on and manifest into something. Because we look at every closed transaction as there's two sets of people that could be our advocate. Yes. Not somebody like the opposite. We hate when people are like, oh, that agent doesn't call me back or that agent is rude or that agent doesn't know enough about the marketplace. So our standard is always going to be yeah. how to ABC, always be changing and improving, right? And I would think a lot of, I mean, a lot of the high-end realtors I work with are just in it for the money, but you guys are so in it for the people. And let's talk about mm -hmm. the people that you guys support because it's not just about the the side of the business that makes you money. It's about the side of the business that needs your help too. So mm -hmm. you guys are philanthropists. You give back. You spend a lot of time at Chalk. My kids have been there for very serious things. So I have a heart for that place. Um, mm -hmm. So talk about what you do there and how that helps you. Um, you know, I'm going to just say one thing because Lily actually is kind of spearheaded the whole thing with Chalk. She's on the foundation board. But I'll tell you, you know, growing up here, uh, my mom's a physician and she was a provider at Chalk. And, you know, coming here as immigrants, you kind of have that survivalist mentality mm -hmm. where, oh my gosh, we have to take care of ourselves just to live. And, you know, our parents went through that so we could have a thriving mentality. And to me, the best definition of thriving is giving back. It's not just lining your pockets with more money or more cars or watches or whatever. And to be able to have the opportunity to help out some place mm -hmm. like Chalk, because mm -hmm. we know as we have, you know, we're in this fancy office right now with all this expensive recording equipment and all this designer interior design stuff with us dressed to the nines. Yes. There's somebody that's in a hospital bed. There's somebody that doesn't have food. That's right. So, you know, Lily and I have, and I will say this, Lily's actually the one that kind of sparked that in our household when I first started dating her and then we got married and we moved in together, mm -hmm. I saw nine envelopes from like St. Jude to like ASPCA, whatever, like mm -hmm. every animal and hospital, like, you know, whatever <laughs> donation. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what the check amounts were in there, but I just know she was making an effort to give every single month. And that really kind of resonated with me as like, wait a minute, this is kind of a responsibility. And uh, we just made it a point right away when we started this business um, to be able to give a portion of the mm -hmm. proceeds to, it wasn't chalk initially, but about four years ago, mm -hmm. it did turn into chalk, and it's been the best thing ever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's That's the most great. rewarding. It's yeah. better than any commission yeah. check. That's great. Yeah, so we, I think your... we take that pretty, I think it's really important. You know, we became successful really quickly, and um, I just felt like it was the right thing to do, is we have to just give something, we have to do something. And now that we have children, I'm really trying to get them more involved with um, giving back and understanding, Like especially during the holidays. We did a lot of adopting families and you know the chalk toy drive and collecting toys, and I really made it a point to them to understand there's a lot of children out there who don't get to have all the toys or you want a toy they don't get to have it or amazon doesn't deliver to them so you know i think it's really important to instill that in a lot of you know in our children right now so i'm really thankful and blessed that we were part of chalk especially since we did become um uh members of the foundation when we had natasha so i think once we had our daughter right it really hit home the kid things and you tour the hospital and everything and it just you're just like oh gosh what can yeah, i, I mean, what, you, what can i do you've been there you know what's funny is we were donating to them for i'd say like eight or ten months before we actually had a chance because we were so busy mm -hmm. to tour the hospital when you tour the hospital it is like no other place. Yeah. It's a place that, you know, not only is it like high tech and obviously it seems funded. Uh, I had a misconception because they advertised on billboards and they had really cool kind of, you know, chic marketing that they were like the Neiman Marcus of like hospitals. So they had right. excess of money, right? I didn't realize there's two empty floors and there's all these like funded needs that are just 
you know, vacant. And even though they get a lot of help, they need more, right? And more. they're helping every single program they add on helps like a whole nother demographic in our town. And I, I'll say this, and I and I will say this to the day I die. I think you always have to take care of your backyard before you go out and take care of some other place, right? So, I agree. you know, uh, like, you know, I'm Persian, I'm Iranian, there's like starving kids there. It's a real messed up political environment, but I'm not gonna donate outside of this country when there's, you know, starving kids here, there's kids in a hospital that need more help because this is my home. So for me, again, no disrespect to anyone that does anything outside, more power to you, but our philosophy is to take care of our backyard, to take enrich the environment yard. as yep. much as we can because people think like, oh, glitzy Newport Beach. I mean, go down to Orange. There's like homeless people yes. <laughs> everywhere. There's like mm-hmm. motel kids. There's like so many needs that you know yeah. we take for granted, just like you know, drinking, whatever it might be. And the thing that we were impressed with most about Chalk is the staff there. I mean, the intensity of care, the genuine. They would work desire. there for free if they could. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. great. I mean, yeah. I don't know if you had the same experience. Yeah, when absolutely. They're extremely dedicated. Yeah, and we we can't believe how many of our friends have gone through chalk and said the experience was like. Mm-hmm. I mean, you might hear nothing's perfect. You might hear one or two things that people say, but. 95, 99% of it was just overwhelmingly positive. So we feel blessed to be able to help and be associated. And one thing I will say too is like Lily and I, you know, you know, we can only donate so much, right? But what we also decided to do was kind of be advocates for the hospital mm-hmm. because we deal with affluent clients to kind of make people shake them and say, hey, listen, they need your help. And we mm-hmm. can do a lot more by bringing in other people than just donating ourselves. I love it. Yeah, yeah. My, my, my takeaway here is why wouldn't a client want to work with your group? I mean, you guys show up on time, you're mm-hmm. dedicated family, and you have great principles and great morals, and you give back to your backyard. You know, So how can our team, our group, our nation, our country work with you, get behind you, or follow you? You know, you can uh, follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Those are our two major platforms. It's just Daftarian Group. You can follow Lily if you want to see more of her life, kind of being like super mom. Super mom. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. I'll tell you a funny story about Lily. So we, she's gone. She's definitely not a nanny person, reluctantly uses a babysitter on date night or, you know, all the <laughs> events we go to. And uh, I, I told her one day, I said, you know, I, I love her nanny, but why does she arrive to the house at 9.15 when you're gone by then? And then she leaves at 3 when the kids are still in school. That doesn't make any sense. That's not a nanny. Right. A nanny nannies. Right? Nannies. She goes, well, no, she's our nanny. I go, there's no kids at home before her to nanny. That's a housekeeper. Mm-hmm. Yes. And she's like, kind of doesn't say this, but I think she'd rather have help with like some dishes or laundry than someone helping raise her kid. That's great. And um, I was like, she. I almost think she likes... The pain and the pressure of doing everything herself but she's so hands-on like she will literally not even want to do like a hot lunch that's great you know so it takes a special person to like do all these things i couldn't i always tell myself like if i was reincarnated as like a woman there's no way i could be like a, a mom like lily and do all this stuff i just don't understand how she runs at that red line all the time but she does it and she does it with a smile and uh, gracefully and laughs and mm-hmm. has a great time so I'm, I'm blessed i think the best decision i made was to marry her. That's the, I mean, the whole crux of this business. If I was with any other woman, I think she'd think like, you're gone too much, you're too crazy about work, you have no balance, you don't care enough. It would be a lot of insecurity. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, so yeah. I think that's like going back to like how you can help is follow us, watch our story, spread the word about what we're trying to do with clients. I mean, look, realtors is a personal thing. People in our marketplace, if they get referred to us, that's how they call, call us. All the marketing is kind of like self-promotional magazines, mailers, all that stuff. Our business is a very intimate business. So if people understand, like, you know, what is, like, one thing I always took away from Tom Ferry, he said, people need to know you, trust you, and like you. And I really like that saying, because if they know you, then they know that, hey, should I call you versus your competitor, right? And, you know, I saw you, you know, and again, I always kind of bring up names here, but John Monagle is a guy that you guys work with, right? He's built a great empire, you know, obviously kind of changed direction in the business and kind of reinvented himself. So I give him a lot of credit and, you know, he's an excellent marketer. You know, his business strategy is different than ours. So we're not going to go out there and get every seller to call us. Someone's going to want to work with him or, you know, Tim Smith or other people, but people that want a real hands-on experience from someone that has a group that has very high expectations of themselves, that's a good fit for us. Mm -hmm. Not every client needs to call us, not every seller or buyer. But, you know, for us, we want to work with people that are in line with our mentality, which is do good work, work your tail off. The market's changing. Advice right now is going to be more important than ever. Mm -hmm. And understanding the market, you know, what is a softening market, you know, to you, Ben? Like when people say, hey, the market's softening, what does that mean to you? That means they are slower to me. Things are slower. Now, in real estate, 
that just means what? Longer days on market. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. So if that's happening, right, if you um, see those longer days on market, then you have to adjust your sales. I mean, Mm -hmm. you know, our business is like, you know, kind of going through the ocean. You don't know what what you're going to hit, but you just have to be able to navigate through it. So I think our worth and our value is going to be exponentially more helpful for people in today's market and tomorrow's market than it was in the last five years. Because you could call your cousin that worked at Nordstrom last week to list your house because the MLS probably helped sell it more than they did. And that's not in the future. So for me, for uh, telling all realtors out there that are listening, there's more opportunity today. Market shakeups and shifts create more opportunity. If everything's status quo, it's going to be harder for you to crack a new market or take your business to the next level. Um, For all your mortgage originators, because I have an intimate knowledge Um, about that business, you know, if you want to go out and attract realtors and you want to go out there and get the top producer to work for you, then find a solution in their business. You know, we um, have great service providers and some of them that we use today we didn't use before and I didn't think we were ever going to switch. But, um, you know, I'll I'll mention, you know, Serena from Prominent Escrow. She's our main escrow hub. I know her. She's great. Yeah, she's fantastic. We love Mariner's Escrow. There's a lot of great granite. There's so many great escrow companies by the coast that run just at such a level 10 with customer experience. But one thing that Serena did was kind of just figure out where some gaps were in our business uh, just on a, just from a broker preview basis, kind of giving us market data to help, you know, kind of customize our, our, you know, like, for example, our our realtors could kind of templatize kind of like what's going on the market. I mean, so many little things but mm-hmm. like that is an example where a mortgage provider has so much data available they have a right. whole team they usually work at a bank or a big lender they have support staff like you I mean look at your office is much bigger than like a small real estate office right, right? so you have so many tools that you could help a mortgage person with outside of your you know coaching business and this you know this you know, podcasts and things like that. Uh, it could be just going in and like assessing someone's social media. Like a lot of the way we get business is going and assess problems and provide solutions. Yes. Versus like, hey, pick me, I'm the best, or I'm I'm the most expensive, mm-hmm. or I'm the cheapest. We don't want to be a commodity. We want to be an advisor. So I think there's, you know, if I'm a mortgage originator anywhere in the country and there's like two, three top producers, I'm going to figure out what they're not doing. And I'm going to like start giving them my advice and giving them reasons mm-hmm. why it should work. And they might choose to work with me, but might, might not. But I'm not going to get their business by saying, hey, I've got the best 5-1 arm in the business. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, all these things are such great tools. I mean, people should listen to this over and over and over again because you'll learn something new every single time Mm -hmm. these guys open their mouths. It's something that has helped their business grow. And if you want to grow, you'll follow the paths of successful people. My takeaways are prepare for everything that you do. Study like a fanatic. Commit to your business. Don't ever give up. Put your family first and work with who you love. And if you do those things, you'll be very successful. So I admire you guys for all the things you're doing, you're supporting. Uh, follow this group. They're going amazing places. They were number 48 last year. They'll probably be number four this year. And if you like what they're doing, follow them. If you like what we're doing, follow us at BenAnderson.365. Again, BenAnderson.365. Let's go crush it. Thanks for having us. Thank you're welcome, you. guys. See you soon.